All right, hello and welcome to another live hangout session with Cascadia Seller Solutions. My name is Christina Evans. I am a partner and the director of business development. Here with me tonight are Emily Murray and Kelly Johnston. Both are also partners as well as consultants for their respective areas of expertise. Emily with content, customer experience, coaching, Kelly with brand protection, uh, listing and account reinstatement, all that good compliancy stuff. Uh, we're gonna dig right in tonight. We've had a lot of questions over the last week since our last session. And uh, one of the main questions uh, that we get asked actually quite a bit, um, we're asked a lot how we came to be and, and why we do what we do. Um, a lot of the folks in our space are former internet marketers or people who started in selling, like doing Craigslist or reselling textbooks. Cascadia is unique in that we're a group of former Amazonians and our philosophy is that every person in the company deserves a living wage. Um, that makes us a bit more ex on the expensive side than some of our competition, but everyone who works on accounts has the experience and the background necessary to do the job whether it's an experienced merchandiser in China or a native English speaker in Pennsylvania or Washington or Indiana. One thing that holds all of us together is how we know our founder, Rachel Greer. Uh, Rachel brought both of you on at the same time, right, Kelly and Emily? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I don't know when you met her, Emily, but I know that I met Rachel back in uh, 2008 in the infamous hall desk area where poor Rachel had to be subjected to uh, enormous amounts of foot traffic, and everyone could see everybody as they went by to go to the bathroom, which is terrible. Um, and true to her very, very Rachel nature, she devised a way out of that desk that uh, when I had a new person coming to my team uh, and moved kind of kitty corner to where she was, uh, <clears throat> she was able to kind of swap in there. And I also worked tangentially with Rachel when I was in compliance. Um, export compliance for a, a short time um, and then I moved to North Carolina in 2014 after leaving Amazon in 2013 and I hadn't found anything that fit really well so uh, Rachel contacted me about joining Cascadia and helping sellers do what I did for years for Amazon but I did it on the outside this time but Emily you were already here when I got there yeah I too was in kind of a great place to just jump at it and I had actually known um, Keith who is Rachel's husband for a very long time we had our very first job together so I've known him since I was 15 years old I believe very long time um, so anyhow I um, was friends with Rachel and he worked at Amazon before in the 90s and so Rachel hired me on um, back in 2011 to do the product safety um, and recalls stuff that she was working on. Um, so, and she was pregnant at the time and uh, used to say that she was surprised that anyone even liked her after all that. <laughs> she was so grumpy. <laughs> Um, so I was at Amazon until 2014 doing the product safety and recall stuff and um, then I moved to Mexico because I just needed a change to my life. So I ended up moving here uh, where I live now and um, it's wonderful and uh, basically what ended up happening with me is that if you, if you don't work for Amazon or one of the tech companies, um, it's very hard to make a living in Seattle and I just found that I was tired of running on that treadmill. So. Um, I decided to do something else, and I have my own little via here, and go to the beach every day, and um, it's wonderful. The only problem was that I was working as a writer, um, which is kind of piecemeal work and, and doesn't pay very consistently. So um, when Rachel had the idea to make um, Cascadia, and I said, okay, yeah, let's do that. So, yeah, it's been a great time just kind of going with the flow and uh, doing whatever needs to make Cascadia's clients healthy and successful. That's my plan. Awesome. So I joined in December 5th, uh, 2015, a few months after y'all, and Rachel said, <laughs> Rachel said it was because I got all of us 10 free fast passes at Disneyland, which totally <laughs> happened. Um, she said, no one ever gives me free stuff. And... <laughs> At that time, Cascadia, I mean, we were we were babies in a sense. Um, we only had uh, account reinstatement clients and um, some private label development and testing. That was about it. 
Wow, well, that's crazy to even think that that was the truth, but we were rather embryonic back then. Right, right, that's a, that's a good word for it. Yeah, and so the original concept for Cascadia centered around that product mm -hmm. testing and, and safety measures and, and meeting those regulatory requirements that everyone loves so much, um, <laughs> as well as being proactive and reactive with seller accounts. But I know that Rachel always, always plays the long game. She's the strategist. And she had been working on getting private labels set up and end to end and getting the China folks on board, being able to do that first part, which you know happens in January so we could get Amazon basic sales sourcing, all that kind of stuff. Um, she was really, really working hard. She brought Jennifer, our imports guru on board, and Suzanne King, our compliance person in March. And she brought with her her huge depth of experience in testing, uh, product development for all kinds of consumer products and, and including food. Yeah, we're about 20 people strong now um, with a team of five in China even. So we've grown quite a lot in a year and a half, both in the U.S. and in China, um, to better support our clients and to really um, enact the vision that Rachel had instilled in us from the beginning. So it's cool to see it's happening. Yeah. Um, Emily Kelly, speaking of enacting vision, I was set on business development really early on. and been scoping out a lot of the competition and social media covering our, our area and our, our space. And I'm seeing a lot of videos that are being posted as quote unquote helpful to sellers in getting their accounts or ASINs reinstated. Sometimes the videos themselves actually are helpful. Um, but I'm seeing comment after comment on them about teaching people how to open multiple stealth accounts on Amazon, using templates for appeals, et cetera. Um, I saw one company that does reinstatement templates for $99. Are these things viable options, Kelly? I mean, tell me true. Am I selling a lie here? <laughs> oh, all right, all right, all right. Everybody just calm down. <laughs> <laughs> So what really makes an expert? I mean, valid question, and I'm sure a lot of people out there ask themselves that when they see all that content. Um, I can be called an expert because of that, you know, maximum of it taking 10,000 hours to truly become an expert at anything, because I was at Amazon for almost 10 years, nine and, nine and three quarters, if you want to be precise, um, and in seller performance for seven of those years. So that's a total of 19,000 hours of total spent at Amazon. A lot of life. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, I'm an expert on this. I know what I'm talking about, and I'm going to tell you that you have to be careful in trying to gauge who's an expert and who's not. Um, I've been looking at a lot of these videos, Christina, because I come across them as well. People send them to me, or I find them just in Facebook forums, and I've seen some of the exact same things that you've seen, and they are really not viable options, the templates specifically. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, they're just not viable. Just you don't want to use those. Um, I want to talk about one of the other videos I had seen today about Amazon holding your money. I know that one's been making the rounds. It's been kind of hot. Um, and it talks specifically about Amazon doesn't care. They're going to hold your money. They'll hold it for indefinite periods of time. But, you know, stand up and, and fight for your money and, and be annoying. Well, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons Amazon holds your money. Um, their terms of service does say that if you are blocked, as in you are banned from the platform and you are not coming back, they will hold your money for 90 days to cover claims and chargebacks and things of that nature. And that's absolutely true. And if that happens to you, that's what you can expect to see is that language stating that. But if you're suspended, meaning they told you, hey, we've temporarily suspended your selling privileges, your money is on hold until either you get reinstated, which could take weeks, or you get blocked finally, at which point from the date that you're blocked, 90 days from that date is when your money's coming to you, however much of that is left. There's a third thing. If your account's locked out, like you can't get in, you're completely just unable to log in, like you don't exist, you're probably never going to get your money back. So, you know, watch who you take your advice from. And I'm not saying this to slag or, you know, be very, you know, dismissive of anybody else in our space, but there are many people masquerading as experts and they don't always know what they're talking about. They can seem convincing, they can seem like they know what they're talking about, but honestly, caveat and tour. You, you know, buyer beware. And maybe Kelly, this is um, a 
another can. I, I, I happen to open cans of worms, it seems like, every session. So maybe this is a, a bigger discussion for a later session, but um, do they have a right to do that? So Amazon is is essentially got over their domain. They, I mean, they own it. They can do what they want. They have their terms of service. When you sign up to use the platform, um, you sign something saying something. So yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? So do they have a right to do those things? Obviously, you have a right to your money, but. Well, yeah. So when you sign on to become a seller on Amazon or a buyer, regardless of what service at Amazon you are using, you are signing a term of service of some sort. And when you sign that, you are agreeing to Amazon's terms, um, which will say, if I get booted from the platform, you can hold my money for 90 days. Or if you find that I'm engaging in fraudulent activity, you're going to keep my money forever. It basically, yes. I mean, they have the right to do that. Legally, they are entering into a type of contract with you, and you sign it. You are liable for those terms. Now, that's not to say that they don't make mistakes. It's not to say that um, things go wrong intentionally otherwise, mixture of those two things. And if you feel that you're owed your money, then you absolutely should fight for it. There's no reason not to do that. But I want you to be aware, audience folk, that people who are telling you that there's an easy fix or they absolutely 100% can guarantee anything with getting your money back or getting you reinstated or getting you a, a completely viable plan of action, that should make you run for the hills. That's a red flag because no one can guarantee anything on Amazon except Amazon. I think from a business development perspective, um, when I take calls and people are like, mm -hmm. well, can you guarantee? and <laughs> we always strive for transparency and you know the answer is no we can't guarantee any when amazon is the ultimate decider of your fate at some point it doesn't matter how expert even we are and we're very good at what we do but if amazon has made a decision it's i mean that's up to them we can't change their mind and nobody else in this space can change their mind right and i want to go back to the template pmas for a second because that really annoys me <laughs> Really, I spend so much of my time um, working with my clients to craft viable plans of action to get their ASINs or their accounts back. And I'm sorry, but $99 kind of devalues what I do. I mean, come on. I spend enormous amounts of time doing this and with the goal of complying with Amazon policy um, and solving the root cause that had these actions happen. So, Sellers out there who are contemplating that $99 template, I have a piece of advice for you. If you have ever gone to college, you are very well aware that college professors will run your paper through various little apps and whatnot to check if you are plagiarizing. Amazon will do that as well. So if you take one of these plans of action, not only are you risking them going, oh, I found this 47 places on the internet. Clearly this seller put no effort into this. Um, it may not even address your issue because if you don't know what the root cause of your problem is, how can you expect a $99 template to attack that and fix it? Because what, do, what does Amazon want? How many times have I said this again? Accountability, corrective action, proactive action. You are not going to get that, not in quality, out right. of the template. You're all right. So it seems like there's a lot of fear in general about what happens on Amazon. And that's really too bad. I know that y'all, all of you, worked there for years, and you're all pretty fantastic, in my opinion. Uh, but there's a lot of naysayers out there. What do you all think about the Amazon marketers preaching fire and brimstone that Amazon's going to tank, or really the constant calls for diversification? Well, I mean, look, it's always possible that Amazon could go the way of the dodo, but I really don't see that. I mean, just was it today, I think it was, that they announced that they're intending to hire 100,000 people in the U.S. alone between now and 2018. Companies who are failing don't do that, and they certainly don't make those kinds of announcements. And I just, just Amazon's not going away. Come on. Let's be realistic. Right. And to Kelly's point about diversification, it's not just about whether you could be shut down. Um, it's really about staying current with what's coming up in uh, internet marketing. And you used to be able to just 
um, use review groups to immediately kickstart your listing, and now you can't do that. You have to build a list off of Amazon through your own website or through um, Facebook marketing. Right. Um, that means multiple learning tools, um, figuring out how to navigate Google Ads, um, which we prefer um, over Facebook, by the way. And uh, whether things like Pinterest is a right tool for you, um, it can really get overwhelming sometimes. Even in Amazon land, um, just because you get your merchant account suspended, you might still be able to sell FBA. And multiple clients have had their seller accounts included and still sold as vendors before. So it's not the end of the world. But. So speaking of vendors, a question I've been getting from a lot of clients lately is, what's the difference between Vendor Express and Vendor Central? OK, they're pretty similar. Um, but Vendor Express is a self-service vendor relationship with Amazon, which allows for up to five um, enhanced marketing content, A-plus pages. Um, our recommendation is typically just to sign up for Vendor Exp Express to um, sort of unlock that free enhanced marketing content that you can get. Um, Vendor Central is an invite-only account that allows for several different types of enhanced marketing content and other advertising tools. Um, they're both Amazon platforms, however, one is self-service and press, and um, the other you have to be invited to, which is um, Vendor Central. Um, both methods actually provide Amazon a very huge margin. It's about 55% of the total sale price. Um, so it's not really a great proposition for most sellers um, because you usually can't get products at such a low cost that it makes sense to hand over 50% of your... Um, I, love you. I, said, I love you, Amazon. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got to eat. Um, so the only real benefit that we've been able to suss through this little thing is actually just the marketing piece of it. Um, so that being said, though, um, Amazon appears to be giving brand registered sellers enhanced content in Seller Central very soon. That's something that might be coming. So uh, we will only use um, Vendor Express typically for the free pages. Um, Vendor Central is basically for the big sellers who don't have to, don't want to deal with Amazon customers themselves. They would rather um, use Vendor Central to do that. Vendor Express is mostly. Um, <laughs> useless, except that um, it does great things for the, the free pages. So that's that's really why we like it the best. Okay. So detail page ownership is an interesting topic and one I've been trying to understand myself for a while. Um, what's the difference between a listing and an ASIN and a detail page? Okay, so um, high level, Amazon's catalog is sorted by ASIN. Um, ASIN stands for Amazon Standard Identification Number. Um, the catalog lives on its own and is used by vendors, sellers, and advertisers as a whole. Um, the detailed page is the view of the catalog ASIN that is seen by customers on their mobile or computer devices. So when you go to Amazon.com and look at it, that's what we're looking at. It really refers to the experience of the user um, how things look to them as opposed to what the ASIN contains. The listing is, however, the offering, the, the ASIN for sale, whether um, Amazon or a seller, the listing is the, the meat of the thing. Yep. Um, a seller can, in fact, have multiple listings against the same ASIN. Um, if they're FBA and, M oh, and MFN, they can have, they can have dual listings. Yeah, I would think of the ASIN as the anchor. That's where everything comes from. But it's a great point that the detail page is the view that we as users, when we're looking at the site, that's what we see. Yeah, that makes a little bit more sense. So Kelly could have started um, an ASIN, and I can jump on that with my own offering. Yep. Got it. We'll do it. <laughs> There's not the terminology. So if sellers have been told, <laughs> that they have to update a listing by February 15th, 2017 in health and personal care, um, that they're required to list ingredients of over the cabinets, and file split. What does that mean? Um, they were also told to make sure secondary product images show the ingredients panel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these sellers are listening against the ASIN. 
and the ASIN needs to be updated. Um, what we expect to happen is that all the listings will be suppressed on ASINs um, that aren't compliant after the deadline. So while as a seller, you may not be the person who made the ASIN in the catalog, you don't own the brand. Um, if you list against it, you're responsible for the content on the detail page um, in Amazon's eyes. So you can either hope someone else does it or try to edit it. Um, but you may not have the right level of editing authority to do that. Ugh, another term. What is <laughs> editing authority? Editing authority um, means that you have the right level of rating to be allowed to edit the listing itself. Okay. So for most sellers who sell their own products and get brand registry, they have full editing authority on their brand's own listings, of course. Um, for experienced sellers, which Amazon trusts, they can also edit ASINs, which aren't in any other seller's brand registry and aren't in any other vendor's catalog. Um, so you might try to make edits to the pages you're listing against, and if they don't work because you um, don't have editing authority, then there's really nothing more that you can do. Um, we had somebody ask a question here. It said that um, apparently you cut out for a minute. Um, what are the sellers being required to do? Um, they sell in health and personal care. What deadline are we talking about? The deadline that was given uh, in the messages I've seen was February 15th. To do what? To make changes to the ASIN to make it compliant so that the ingredient list, and this is specific to over-the-counter medications and dietary supplements. Sellers are supposed to be making changes to their flat files to show um, corrected images that have the ingredient panels and other information visible uh, for buyers that are scoping out these products. So um, that's pretty much what they're asking sellers to do. But as we were talking about, the difficulty comes in if that seller does not have the high enough uh, ASIN authority to make those changes. Um, it's not clear what Amazon expects those sellers to do, but I think Emily hit it right in saying that you either hope somebody else does it or you try to make the changes. If you're unable to, I'd contact seller support and say, hey, I got this message. I've tried to comply. I can't. I think that's the best thing that you can do if you're listing against bare aspirin and for some reason that is not compliant. Of course, it would be compliant, but if it's not, then well, we, you're obviously not there. So what can you do apart from right. seller support? Say. The other thing that struck me about this message that I thought was really weird is that I would expect that kind of message to be aimed at a private label seller that's doing their own supplements or other consumable item because they have such control over the ASIN. Um, but if you're just one of many sellers acting against um, a bear product or you know um, Colgate or something like that, um, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to be able to make those changes. So this was a, a little bit of an odd message for me to see. Um, the first person that talked to me about it happens to be a reseller, so he really probably doesn't have much in the way of ASIN authority. Um, I know that I cut in in the middle of, of asking what editing authority was. Um, did you did you finish up your thought on that, Emily or, or Kelly? Was there anything yeah, more? Yeah, I did. I did, and I was actually hoping that Kelly would touch on um, the idea that you know, there might not be a thing that you can do if you don't have edit editory um, permission on a listing. You can't do anything. And yet, you know, one of your jobs as a seller on Amazon is to be responsible and to be responsive to these things and to acknowledge them. And so, um, yeah, I was just really hoping that Kelly would say, you know, maybe the best thing you can do is just contact Seller Central. Yeah. yeah. So Amazon logs these things at us and we don't really know how to act and so the best thing we can do is go back to our original intention and the intention is to sell well and be professional and do all of the things that are along with terms of service and so in response to this particular thing, maybe the best you can do is just raise your hand and say, hey, I tried, but I'm not there. Hi. Right. You know. <laughs> that does a couple of things. Number one, it shows Amazon that you care and that you're paying attention right. to what they're asking you to do. Um, and number two, it may force them to kind of change some of their behaviors because if they're routinely sending messages that really should be only sent to a small population of seller, then maybe they'll start picking up on the fact that, oh, this kind of messaging causes panic. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't do that. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sticky wicket. And I always tell sellers that they, they need to be invested in the platform 
in a couple of ways, not just in how they sell and how much money they make, but also in making edits to detail pages or suggesting edits when they see bad information. If you see a cell phone and you look at it and go, huh, that's a really strange photo for that. It kind of looks like a wallet. That's a problem. That's a data integrity issue. Report that and get it changed. And it's the same thing with when you see violations on the website. Report yeah. those. Um, search report a violation in Seller Central and it will take you to the appropriate form. And you can say, hey, I saw a seller XYZ doing this and this and this on their ASIN, and I know this isn't permitted. If you are policing the site, you are helping keep it clean, you are helping make it work better, you're making a better experience for buyers, people will buy things that they can find and understand. If you see something, say something. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, it's in the rules. Uh, <laughs> why'd you get all TSA on me? Dang it. <laughs> well, I think that about wraps it up for today. We covered quite a bit of ground and um, we appreciate you joining us every week, this week, next week, um, same time, same place. If you have any questions in the meantime before the next session, uh, feel free to reach out to us via email info at thinkcascadia.com. You can always visit our website, check out our offerings, look at our bios read our blog. We've got some videos there too. Lots of information uh, to help you make the best possible decisions for your Amazon business at www.thinkcascadia.com or you can always reach out to us via good old telephone 206-202-0222. Again, we thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again next time. Bye. Bye-bye.